After, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on supporting students with disabilities through positive behavior interventions and supports. I'm Bob Putnam from the May Institute, and with me is Brandy Simon from the University of Connecticut, uh, Kitty Clemens, who's going to give us a really great example of um, supporting students with disabilities, and our chat and poll master is, uh, is Katie Myers. So we're really uh, excited to have you all here. Uh, hopefully we can give you some suggestions um, how to um, support students with disabilities around adapting and intensifying your, your uh, school-wide positive behavior support. And Brandy's, if you wanna move to the next, we have, this wouldn't be a, a, a PBS session without uh, uh, forum expectations. Probably the most important thing is uh, the chat. Um, if you want to make comments um, on and that, uh, we would really love you to post positive on to topic comments um, uh, between yourselves and between uh, Katie, we'll take a look at that. But if you want to ask questions, the way we're organizing this is um, I'm going to go over what, what are the uh, practices and uh, relative to uh, all students and how we uh, intensify those particular practices and adapt those for students with disabilities. And Brandy's gonna go, uh, review some exciting and new uh, resources for, uh, for students with disabilities. And then Kitty's gonna give us an example. Um, between the three of us, we're expecting we're gonna go about an hour. And so we're gonna uh, leave 15 minutes for questions. So we would love to make sure you put your questions in the polls so um, that we can answer them at the, at the very end. So you've all gotten here. So you've all been able to find your registered sessions in Pathable. Uh, great job. Um, throughout the, uh, the rest of the sessions, you wanna go back into my agenda and then click on the session that you registered for. And um, we would want you to fill out the polls. So if you can go and look at um, your Pathable uh, site, there'll be uh, a listing. So we really know who's in the, um, in the session and we can kind of tailor what we're doing relative to the, uh, the uh, population of you that are in this particular session. So just remember chat is for engaging with other participants around the session topic. And polls are really where you want to put your questions because those are really what we're going to be addressing at the end of the session. Uh, and if you accidentally navigate away, you want to go back into um, uh, my agenda, click on the session, and then click on uh, attend the meeting, and you'll be back right back in our session. And if you really need some help, we have a help desk that, uh, that will uh, help answer any of your questions, uh, particularly around the technology. So that's available as well. The session organizers have really done a great job trying to organize this and try to help people in terms of navigate through the technology. And we're all kind of learning as we go. So just a, a plug for a, uh, a great study that's going on um, around developing a tool for college and career readiness uh, for, for transitions. Um, there's a stipend of $5,000 uh, for those schools that would be interested in terms of providing feedback on the tool. And as, as you know, this um, session, the, the PowerPoint slides are available in the, uh, in this session information. And uh, if you're looking for more information, go to those slides and that will provide you uh, more information. So our session's objectives, we really wanna look at describing the critical features of PBS to support students with uh, disabilities, how to differentiate and intensify, uh, because uh, many of these practices are just about all these practices that we teach for, for um, teachers and uh, other staff around developing effective tier one interventions. Um, and what we're really looking at is how we can differentiate and intensify those to really strengthen your tier one interventions for those students with disabilities. Um, and that uh, the, th the third part is uh, Brandy's gonna go over some really great center resources to help support your work. So, um, when we look at in terms of where do students with disabilities fit, 
uh, within the uh, PBS MTS framework. There's a misrule that students with disabilities uh, are at tier three. Uh, we really wanna, if you don't walk away with anything else here, we wanna make sure you walk away with uh, knowing that uh, PBS is for all. It means all students, uh, our goal, the stronger that we can improve our tier one interventions for all students, including those with disabilities, um, the uh, less number of students that need to have um, targeted tier two interventions and the stronger we can make our targeted interventions, the less number of students that need to have intensive interventions. And, and I know all of you don't have any extra resources or any extra time. So the more, as George points out, the more we can make this efficient and effective for folks, then it it's, it's, uh, allows us to really work with those students that really have uh, the most challenging needs. So why is this important? Um, students with disabilities um, spend most of the time in gen general education settings. Uh, if you look at from, from the Department of Education, over 60% of students uh, with disabilities spend more than 80% of the time in general education. So this is a kind of a, uh, a problem for both special educators as well as general educators. And we really need to rely on general educators because from our perspective, the more opportunities that students with disabilities get to interact with um, and model good students without disabilities, the better it is for everyone. And uh, students with disabilities are likely, more likely to experience exclusionary reactive discipline practices than students without disabilities. For example, according to the Office of Civil Rights, students with disabilities comprise 12% of the student enrollment. That's 12% of the student enrollment. However, they experience 26% of the other school suspensions, 24% of expulsions, 28% of referrals to law enforcement, 71% of restraints, and 28% of referrals to law enforcement. This also, uh, if we look at the, uh, the data from office discipline referrals, uh, we often see uh, dis dis uh, dis uh, disproportionality in terms of discipline. Um, so Katie's uh, brought up one of the polls that we have 40% of people from the elementary level, but oh, it just disappeared on me. Um, so we have 40% from the elementary level and then 60% uh, from other levels. All right, next, Brandy. So this is a great in free, I underline free, uh, resource from the National Technical Assistance Center on supporting students with disabilities uh, in the classroom within. And the, really the emphasis uh, from this practice brief, um, and it's a brief, um, is to really invest in, in prevention, invest, invest in effective tier one interventions for all students, including those students with disabilities. That we really wanna look at how we take school-wide positive behavior support uh, and move it into the classroom so that in fact, we can improve classroom practices and one of our goals is really to have uh, all students in class and on task. If we look at in terms of one of our goals is really to have more students in class and on task. Um, the academics will fall um, because I know all of you have really good academic interventions and the goal is can we make sure we expose all students to those great academic interventions. The tier one is for all students as we've talked about. And that all means all. So we really would want to make sure students that uh, are receiving tier three interventions have, um, have the opportunity to experience tier one and tier two interventions. So we have Dave Letterman's top 10 list um, that we want to go over. And I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, if you go to that disability brief, there will be more information, there'll be more resources that you can have, but I'm just going to kind of review this on a, on a brief basis. So one of the things we want to do is design and adapt the physical environment that we really would want to consider mobility and access to all areas of the classroom, visual supports for students, assistive technology and other supports to promote learning within the classroom environment. So our goal would be to look at those accommodations and modifications we can to the physical environment to really meet all students' needs. Next. And then we wanna uh, really um, determine our routines 
Um, and how we can develop and explicitly teach those routines. So in terms of intensifying and adapting those routines, we may need to have visual supports. So we could have a visual schedule. Um, if we want to intensify this a little bit uh, more that, um, that we may want to put this up on, the, on a student's desk, we may want to make it uh, more interactive and have the student actually check off or if the student has uh, more uh, severe disabilities, they might be using icons to check off. If you look at the hand washing routine that we're really looking at developing um, um, a, a clear set of routines that we can use and that we can review on a regular basis. And then we with school eye positive behavior sport, all of you know, we really want to develop three to five positive expectations. And, and that we really want to have students develop fluency with those expectations. So it's just like George said, putting it up on the wall, but we really like to have students know what those expectations are, know what those expectations might be in terms of whole group or small group or, or individual work. Um, and, and in some cases, we really need to teach and reteach those expectations to build that fluency. We may need to develop a task analysis around, around that that breaks those, those expectations into smaller steps. And we may want to provide some uh, picture uh, prompts or supports to help them in terms of to remember those routines, like my wife does when she really would like me to, to follow through with my tasks, right? One of the other um, evidence-based practices is promoting active engagement. Um, the research indicates the more students are actively engaged. Uh, what we mean by that is actively responding. Um, the higher rates of on-task behavior we usually get. And here's some examples here. Uh, just uh, popsicle sticks with different choices or a kind of a uh, set of flip cards. Um, or if we wanna to go to the electronic uh, version, we could look at Kahoot or uh, Plickers as other ways in terms of involving students. But one of our goals is to really look at in terms of how do we promote more active engagement, active responding. And we really wanna provide prompts, pre-corrections, other reminders to set students up for success. One of my favorite, really efficient uh, prompt is uh, called positive greetings at the door, where that um, uh, students, uh, teachers would greet students at the door, or in this case, in terms of their uh, virtual room, that they would greet the students as they come in, provide a clear expectation. And what we see is that we see higher rates of on-task behavior and high, higher rates of latency to task. So it's one of my favorite um, strategies that oftentimes I teach people uh, around how to improve right off the bat on task behavior uh, in there. And if students are on task, then we tend to see lower rates of problem behavior. Now we're at number six, right? We got four more to go. All right, we wanna actively supervise. So there's some really great examples of actively supervising is moving around, actively scanning, uh, monitoring what's going on in the room, uh, engaging with students. Um, so this is a, another way that we would look at in terms of improving engagement and on-task behavior, reducing problem behaviors uh, with general ed students as well as with students who have disabilities. Now, if we look at in terms of uh, how do we respond to uh, uh, behavior one, we would wanna use uh, behaviorally specific praise, uh, we, uh, which, would, which would label the behavior that we would like to see happen rather than just a good girl or good boy. Uh, uh, and with students, we may need to come up with other ways to motivate them in terms of following the expectations. So we may have token reinforcement systems or copy and good uh, slip systems or other ways that we can reinforce appropriate behavior. And if we're, if we're smart, we really want to use smart error correction system. So one of the ways rather than provide an error correction is could we find a student who's engaged in appropriate behavior nearby and try to acknowledge that student for following the appropriate expectation or remind the student what the expectation would be 
uh, have the student practice the expectation and then reinforce them for actually doing that is another way to look at error correction practices. And that we really wanna use more positives than, than negatives. They, what, what the research recommends is five to one, but, it, but actually in terms of students with disabilities, um, a study last year came out and indicated nine to one uh, was the appropriate level for students with, uh, with disabilities that they may need additional positive reinforcement to, um, to basically follow the expectations that we, that we would like them to fall. And last but not least, we would really want to uh, collect and use data that we would really want to monitor with simple and no one has any extra time, but what are some simple ways that we can um, track progress and so that we could adapt tier one interventions or intensify or modify tier two or tier three interventions. So our goal would be to look at what simple ways in terms of tracking um, the progress of our students um, to really look at. Uh, one would be, can, can we, if we're effective, can we uh, fade out certain types of, uh, of interventions? Um, or on the other hand, can we then modify or intensify those particular interventions that are working? So I'm gonna turn this over to Brandy. I've done my quick introduction. Uh, and she's going to pick it, pick it up and really give us some really great resources that people can refer to. All right. Thank you, Bob. And hopefully folks are hearing and seeing okay and you're participating actively in chat and polls. I'll get to jump over and look at those when I turn it over to Kitty in a second. But it, just as a reminder, if there are any issues with tech through Pathable, you always have the option within Pathable to join into Zoom. So just be aware that that's always an option, but do it with from Pathable going into Zoom. We were having issues with people getting lost if they navigated fully away. So with that, I wanted to kind of come back to where are we now? <laughs> so the resources that Bob just reviewed, I think are good for always, right? Those are the top 10 critical practices, critical ideas. But we actually wrote that list before realizing the impact COVID-19 would have for us. And so what I'd like to do is have us think about where do we need to intensify or pivot a little bit in those same practices? So obviously not throwing out any of the top 10 empirically supported practices Bob just went through really well, but how do we pick kind of where we're gonna emphasize or place our supports, especially as we're spread pretty thin. And so what I'm gonna do is not give you a ton of information, but I'm gonna give you links to resources that have a ton of information in them. So as a center, we came together and George referenced some of the early resources we developed back in March. And we learned a little bit from March through June. So we came together with a bunch of other centers that are listed on this slide to develop an overall return to school guidance document. And I kind of kick us about the title because it doesn't just cover the return to school, but it covers us thinking about what it looks like to move through this period of crisis. So I see this guide likely being updated but still being relevant as long as we are in this context. So please continue to kind of think about this as a resource. But for those of you who have seen it before, you'll recognize that while this guide talks a lot about systems and practices, what it really emphasizes is tier one. So it talks about those structures and supports we can put in place for all students, all staff and all families. And so while those practices, as Bob said, are supportive because we truly mean all truly means all, we also recognize that we need to do a little bit more for students identified with disabilities or students who are at risk. And so in May, we were thinking with other centers, including the National Center for Intensive Interventions, about what are the small things we can recommend to teachers as they think about supporting kids with disabilities in the remote or in-person environment, and also for teachers helping families who are supporting children in their homes. And for many of us who wear both hats of parent and educator, we recognize the unique challenges that families are experiencing as kids are in remote instruction. And while we think those resources were really helpful, we continue to learn. So part of what we learned was that we need to be really targeted in how we intensify supports for students with disabilities. So this new kind of hot off the presses last month resource 
was another collaboration between our center and the National Center for Intensive Interventions. And what this one did is layered on top of that initial return to school guidance document. So it emphasized the same exact practices, but it talked explicitly about how do we intensify those practices and what are some examples of what that looks like are physically with us in a classroom or when they're remote and learning from home. So it gives a little bit more guidance than the first brief. I think they both serve nice functions, so I would continue to look at both of them. But this newer one, if you haven't seen, it would be a good one to. So in the original guide, these practices were highlighted with the idea of going back to basics to establish positive, predictable, and safe learning environments for all kids. And if you think back to George's keynote for folks who were able to see it, he talked about these basic practices being the foundation of trauma-informed approaches, social emotional learning, PBIS, and many of the other approaches we're seeing in, emphasized in schools. And so collectively, these practices, like I said, create positive, predictable, and safe learning environments with the goal of supporting students' social, emotional, behavioral, and academic growth. So these resources pull together the things we need to think about for high leverage instructional practices in addition to social, emotional, and behavioral supports. And in the second guide that I mentioned a second ago, the idea is to then differentiate or intensify these practices. So I'm not gonna spend time reading the slide to you. You have it in the slide deck in the um, files pod. But as you notice, this animates. <laughs> So these are the practices as they're written into the tier one guide, that initial guidance document. And I'm gonna just click through so you can look at where we intensify practices. So it's not brand new and different. It is the same exact practices, but it's thinking about how as we move up the triangle in terms of need and support, how are we a little bit more intentional with what we're doing? So while it's important for all students that we're connecting with families and educators and that we're establishing opportunities for kids to connect with each other, for kids who may have fewer opportunities or may have abilities that are barriers for them to establish those relationships, we have to be even more intentional in how we're modeling and creating opportunities for our students. While screening is important to give us data for all students to be able to identify need and match support, for kids who we know are at risk or already identified, we need to be more planful and purposeful in how we collect information to guide our instruction. And while tier one supports, so having routines, teaching expectations, reinforcing them, all of the things Bob went through, while those are critical for all students, we need to also be able to intensify or differentiate those, whether it's targeted supports like check in, check out, or whether it's intensive individualized function-based supports or more comprehensive plans developed through a wraparound process. As we're teaching, we're thinking about how do we become more targeted with our instructional approaches? So how do we use the high leverage practices to really move the dial for students? And for students who haven't responded, how do we even further intensify and also individualize our approaches based on data? And finally, how do we continue collecting data as we move forward so we know what works and for whom. And as George highlighted in his keynote, equity is a central theme throughout all of our talks. And so this comes to, to bear with students with disabilities as we look especially at the intersectionality of gender, race, and disability, right? So as we're looking at for whom different supports work, we need to make sure we're drilling down by race, ethnicity, by gender and also by disability status. So we can identify places that supports are not working equitably and go back in and enhance those. And there's actually a new equity report that just launched within the school-wide information system that allows you to do those three things. So you can drill down by race, ethnicity, by gender and by disability. So you can actually help make really informed decisions about what is working and for whom. So you can then tweak and tailor your supports to make sure that everyone is truly benefiting. So with that, I wanted to set us up to transition over to Kitty. So I'll stop sharing my screen in one second. But I have had the privilege of working with Kitty and her team at Cedarhurst for, I think, over a dozen years. I was trying to look back and count, and it was before I had a child. It was before lots of major life events for me personally. So I kind of mark some of my work with Cedarhurst from then. 
And they have been such an amazing example of implementation, again, for well over a dozen years. I have learned so much from working with them and learning with Kitty. And so I'm really excited for you all to hear the example of how Cedarhurst pivoted into kind of the new context with their practices. So Kitty, I am stopping sharing so you can get started with sharing. And I'll just remind everyone as we're transitioning to please use chat and Q&A because Katie and I will be monitoring that and we will connect back with Kitty for some Q&A at the end. So Kitty, you are muted. Yeah, got that. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. Um, so I um, am Kitty Clemens. I am the Associate Director at the Cedarhurst School. I'm also a social worker. Um, so that is my field of practice. Um, and I've been at Cedarhurst for going on 18 years. Um, and I'm going to, uh, my, my goal for this is to really sort of give you a sketch of what PBIS looks like at Cedarhurst um, in normal times. And then to try to focus in a little bit more and spend a little bit more time talking about how we how we tweaked and how we uh, modified and adjusted for um, the pandemic. So, Hmm. My, um... so on mine, I have to kind of hold my cursor down on the left corner and then the menu to advance pops up. I have no, did you say the lower left corner? That's usually on mine what, what I do. And if not, I am happy to start sharing and advance for you. Don't see anything coming up. Did you do that? I did that. You did that. Got it. Back, okay. back in business. Okay, here we go. Um, don't know what happened there. So just a general overview, the Cedarhurst School, we're a private therapeutic uh, special education outplacement. So we um, have students, all of our students have an IEP. All of our students receive special education supports. Um, our students have the ED label, special education label, OHI, or um, autism. And that means that our students all have um, social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties that have interfered with their ability to um, be successful in their um, regular schools, um, in their mainstream schools. And most of our students have psychiatric diagnoses. Um, we have middle and high school, so we we, and we have a transition program, which we call the Passage Program. So we serve students from ages 11 to 21. And we also have a, a school engagement program, which is for students who, have, uh, who are profoundly um, school avoidant. We have students from all over Connecticut. Um, we are located in Hamden, Connecticut. And our students are placed by their public school districts and the tuition is paid by the school districts. So um, we do not take private pay. And as a result, we have an incredibly diverse student body. Um, we have a very small class size. So in all of our classes, we have no more than eight students. We have self-contained classrooms where there are no more than eight students with a teacher and a teacher's assistant. And in what we call our mainstream program, um, we have uh, no more than eight students with just one teacher and students move around from class to class. Um, our staff consists of, uh, the majority of our staff is special education teachers. We have uh, social workers, we have a strong clinical program and we have behavioral support staff. And we offer therapeutic groups, all different kinds of social skills groups, DBT, um, coping skills, all kinds of different groups, individual counseling, we do crisis intervention, and we work with um, agencies and treaters who are involved with students in the community as well, pretty intensively. Um, we use Take Space at Cedarhurst as a sort of a foundation. Um, so any of our students can ask to take space when they need to from class or from whatever um, activity they find themselves engaged in. We encourage students to take space um, and to use it proactively and productively um, throughout their days. So um, PBIS uh, has been, as Brandy said, we've been practicing with Fidelity for about 12 years. Um, we started a little before that. Um, and we, we made the mistake of really focusing in at the beginning on tier three interventions. 
uh, that did not work very well for us. And so then we connected with Brandy and she helped us to get reorganized and we uh, moved our focus to um, really shoring up our existing practices and then um, you know, bringing them into um, tier one. And since then um, we were able to implement with Fidelity starting that following year and we've had gradual, um, well, actually we had pretty dramatic progress at first and um, we've been able to meet our annual goals. And as, as you know, students were more, um, you know, on task in the classroom, we began to have pretty significant staff buy-in and then student buy-in and family buy-in. And it's just been a really amazing shift in our culture and our climate um, for the last 12 years as we've, as we've been able to really implement with, with fidelity. Um, so it's been really a, a marvelous practice for us to bring to our school. And this is just one example of uh, how PBIS has um, reduced our office referrals per day. Um, this is average per year um, over the past, you know, since, since first implementation in 2008, 2009. So you can see that the number of office referrals has significantly reduced um, and has maintained um, since 12 years ago. So, what do we do at Cedarhurst in terms of PBIS? Um, we have positively stated expectations. Um, ours are safety, responsibility, and respect. They are posted all over the building. We actively teach them um, and we individually coach them all the time in the milieu throughout the day. Uh, we have a level system, so students have levels A, B, or C. As uh, students carry a card around with them from class to class, this is what the card looks like. And for every class period, students earn points in each of the three areas, safety, responsibility, and respect. And the points are tallied um, each day. This card becomes a really wonderful piece of data um, to use with individual students and then also to use um, the points sort of in the conglomerate um, to look at trends across the whole school. Um, and then the, the percentage of points at the end of each week informs the level that students um, maintain or earn. Um, so these are some examples of some of the privileges and perks that go along with having a level at Cedarhurst and also the criteria for being at, at any level um, at any given time. Uh, we also use a ticket system. So we use tickets to recognize um, and reinforce anything that we feel merits it. And they're in its, you know, based on each of the three um, expectations. So students can earn tickets in the areas of respect, responsibility, or safety. And when we give tickets, this is actually an example of what our ticket looks like down at the bottom there. It's just a little piece of paper and we write in why the student earned the ticket. Um, but the most important piece of the ticket is, is the verbalization that goes along with it when you give the student the ticket. So why, why they've earned it and the praise that goes along with it and the other students in the room also hearing that. And then these tickets are, are collected and used as currency for many different um, things. We've, we have found that it's important to have a diversity of options in terms of what students can use their tickets for and what kinds of things are offered to levels. So if you have, um, you know, lots of different types of students, they're going to be attracted to lots of different types of things. So that's been really important for us to diversify those offerings. Um, we have a homeroom award each week for the homeroom that collectively earned the most tickets. So in that way, we, you know, students really encourage each other to earn tickets. Um, that's called the Rock On Award because of the, the trophy that they get looks like this. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so tickets are used for lots of different things. This is an example of our um, behavioral matrix um, in these in three different contexts, classroom, hallway, hallways, and bathrooms, um, and what we expect to see students doing in each of the three areas to meet those expectations. Um, we have lesson plans that we have developed and continue to um, tweak 
and we teach lessons very proactively on a schedule that's created every year. Um, this is an example of a lesson plan for the classroom. Um, and we can modify lessons if we need to based on data that we're seeing throughout the year to target in on um, areas that we feel need special attention. Um, this is just the rest of this particular lesson plan. Every year we develop an action plan and we focus, you know, we develop goals for that year. Um, these goals that I have listed here were um, very early on. Um, we were looking at reducing the duration and frequency of take space, um, increasing the percentage of students with a level, um, having fidelity to the PBIS framework, and um, I have a four to one ratio of positive reinforcement to negative consequence, which is where we started. And in our practice, as we've kept track of this data, we find that um, it's more like 20 or 25 to one. Um, so as Bob pointed out, um, for students with disabilities, maybe nine to one is what's in the literature, but when you're really doing this practice with fidelity, it's, it's going to be even higher than that. Um, we keep track of data, we compile it quarterly and we disseminate it to all of the staff because that really promotes buy-in um, as staff you know, observes our progress in um, overt form and in data form. We have a PBIS team that consists of a coach and then we have um, representation from all of the different um, fields in on our PBIS team. So teachers, paras, social workers, our director is also on the team, which we find is important. Our student council provides input. So we, we do have student involvement in the PBIS team. And we meet every week consistently. That we have found to be another extremely important piece of our PBIS practice is that we have to meet regularly. Um, we review data, we plan activities, and we problem solve around, um, you know, any specific issues that are highlighted, that are brought to us by staff, or that we see in the data. We have, a, an, in addition to the PBIS team meeting, we have a daily staff meeting, all staff, and we use that meeting to um, disseminate information about PBIS, to, um, you know, elicit feedback from teachers and staff members. Um, we, you know, talk about individual students, we talk about levels, we talk about programmatic issues. Um, and everyone in this way sort of plays a role in PBIS, even if they're not on the team. And we do rotate people through over the years so that everybody in the building has a chance to be on the team. Um, and that we have found to also be um, very helpful. So in terms of student investment, we use our student council to um, sort of get feedback from the student perspective in terms of what's working for them and what isn't working for them. They, they give us ideas about what kinds of reinforcers they wanna see, what kinds of rewards. Obviously it has to be within reason, um, but they've been able to really give us a lot of good feedback. Um, we have a careers class that creates posters to advertise different events and activities that are going on in relation to PBIS. These are some examples here. And as a result, you know, we really have a culture of participation in our school. Um, and we have students, you know, we have students who have been in all kinds of different circumstances who are very hardened and cynical and um, who are 18 or 17 and they're, they come in and they're like, yeah, I want a ticket. They're, you know, it, it really is um, buy-in. Um, and we, we were skeptical uh, at the beginning and our, our teachers were and families have been skeptical and when students first start here sometimes they're skeptical and they don't you know they find it sort of odd to think about getting rewarded because they're not used to it um, and there's a culture of our students there's sort of a peer pressure thing that happens where students will support each other and you know you want to keep your level because you want to be able to play wiffle ball on Friday so make sure you you know do what you do what the teacher's asking you to do so it really works. And in terms of parents, we have um, set a standard for ourselves to have weekly communication home um, from multiple staff, um, teachers and um, clinical staff. We use email. Um, we had 
developed the practice of Zoom video conferencing before the pandemic, uh, because we found that having, having parents from all over the state, um, they often aren't able to get to us. And um, Zoom was you know, a tool that we were starting to use anyway. And then we have also found that texting is a really good form of communication with parents. Um, they're very comfortable with it. And so we had moved to using texting as well. And then um, our communication home, we really try to emphasize what's going well, as opposed to always what isn't going well. Um, and making that shift has been really effective and parents are no longer afraid of us when we call them. Um, they actually look forward to hearing from us. And the point card itself is a communication tool. So often we can send the point card or a copy of the point card home with students so parents can see how the day went, see where the issues are, um, and also reinforce progress at school at home. So there's a continuum there. Uh, in terms of data collection, this can be very cumbersome as Bob alluded to earlier and, and simplifying is good, but we've also found that diversifying responsibility for data collection has been helpful. So um, everybody plays a role and we really try to break it down into small parts so that no one person is doing too much. Um, our data really drives all of our decisions on the student level and then on the school wide level. So we can look at, you know, location as areas that need more intervention. We can look at times of day. We can look at if there's a staff member who's, you know, having a lot of um, you know, office referrals, we can figure out how to intervene there just as examples. So just to tell you a little bit about how PBIS has been sustained for so long with Fidelity, the key the key here is that we modify as we go. So we, we look at our practices that aren't working, um, we address newly identified issues, and, we, um, and then we modify or we enhance or we add to PBIS. An example being when we developed our school engagement program, we really, you know, we realized that attendance, um, we were having more and more sort of chronic attendance problems. And so we created a whole program um, and we really leaned on, on PBIS to help us figure out how to reinforce attendance on the on the tier one level, tier two level, and tier three level. So it's it's a practice that really um, encompasses everything that we do. So just here's another example um, in our in our setting, um, tier two. All of our students are in therapeutic groups. All of our students get individual counseling, and almost all of our students have um, therapists outside of school with whom they get, you know, from whom they get support. So our tier two plans look a little bit different and we had to really modify um, and sort of figure this out as we went along. But what we, what we use tier two for is to really hone in on specific behaviors for, for students who meet criteria for a tier two plan. Um, and we, we have a whole process by which we interview the student, the family, all of the teachers. It's, it's a little more like a tier three maybe in a, in a different setting. Um, and then we decide with the student what behavior to focus on. And then this is an example of some, some questions that we would put on the back of a student's point card so that each period of the day, um, the, the student would be responsible for having their teacher fill this out um, to indicate whether they met these these specific behavioral expectations in that period. And then if they, if they we set specific criteria for, for how often they do meet those expectations and then they get some kind of reward. And we've decided that the reward is always going to be around contact with a preferred staff member and engaging in some kind of activity or spending time with that preferred staff member. So this is, an, this is a template for a tier two support plan. Um, and it always involves a you know, non-contingent time with that preferred staff member during each week so that there can be coaching um, around the specific behavior and then a contingent re a reward um, that the student has to sort of meet that specialized criteria to earn. And then we modify and um, fade uh, when we can. So that's just one example of a modification. So, 
then March came and the pandemic hit and we went from one day being in school and the next day to being in Zoom and Google Classroom and having synchronous classes. I um, mean, we, we literally went one day in school and the next day we were online. Um, so we had the benefit of a little bit of foresight. We were able to prepare a little bit. We were able to help our students practice on the technology before we had to close the building. Um, but I just want to tell you a little bit about how we've how we've enhanced and um, modified our our practices um, in the context of the pandemic. So, um, the key is what I just said, which is modifying the program as we go to uh, correct ineffective practices and address newly identified issues. So. It's ineffective to think that we're going to be together because we're all at home in our living rooms on Zoom. So we really had to stretch and modify quite a bit. But because this was already our practice, we were really able to use PBIS and modify it. And it, thank goodness we had it because it really helped us to engage students in remote learning. And now it's helping us to engage students in hybrid learning. Um, so referring back to Brandy's slide about um, differentiating and intensifying critical practices, I just, I'm going to walk you through some of the things that we've done and how they, um, you know, connect to these five practices. So first and foremost, it was very apparent to us right away um, that we needed to completely focus on engagement. Um, so there were some students who were very comfortable with Zoom and Google Classroom and staying home in their living rooms to do their school every day. But many students were just, just dropped off the face of the planet um, or would pop on and pop off and pop on and pop off and go play video games and then come back to class and just not you know, consistently engaged. Um, so huge variability there. Um, and we realized that we weren't seeing the kinds of really overtly disruptive behaviors that we typically deal with in the school building. Um, and instead, we really were seeing just students checking out. Um, so we had to prioritize presence and engagement over, over anything else. Um, and we had to really, as a staff group, reset our expectations for what school would look like. Um, what academics would look like, what our expectations were of the students, of ourselves. Um, and so we initially set about um, sort of redefining our expectations, our behavioral expectations. Um, and we decided as a team to just focus on engagement. So what is engagement? Attendance. Um, so whether you're there or not, but then furthermore, participation and then defining what does participation look like? So screen on, participating in the classroom stream in Google, um, participating on the Zoom chat. Many of our students are very anxious to have their screen on. And so what are other ways that students can demonstrate participation and defining those ways? Um, we had to revamp our grading policy. We had to, um, completely change the way we reinforce um, and reward students who have their levels uh, or who earn tickets. And um, we had to be sure that we were teaching, coaching and reinforcing the appropriate use of technology, of Zoom, of Google Classroom. And one of the mistakes that we made early on was to take for granted that young people sort of get this easily and know how to do it and don't need our help. Um, and we, and then the other mistake I think is assuming that just because somebody can do it one day that they know how to do it the next day. So we have found that you just continually have to offer support and coach and students aren't necessarily gonna tell you when they don't know how to do what you're asking them to do. Um, so our data collection, um, the way that we did this in completely remote and we're continuing to do this in hybrid is that teachers were com would communicate. We realized that we had to monitor engagement all throughout the day, like every period, every minute of the day we had to monitor engagement. So teachers uh, would communicate to the social workers by email 
when a student disappeared or was not engaged. And then that way, social workers could track attendance and engagement, but also could connect with students, connect with families, problem solve, intervene, and get students back into class in real time. Um, and that process just continually happened every day. And this is an example of um, this is this is one this is one day. These are oh, sorry. This is one week. These are multiple students. So each line represents a student, um, and each column, each each box represents a day. Each column represents a period. Um, and we used a key and we we can, we've sort of kept track, the social workers kept track of when students were in attendance, when they were absent, when they had an excused absence and when they were sort of incompletely engaged. Um, and teachers could look at this data in real time. We, we updated this as we went along each day. And then we use this, this information to um, determine levels and to determine reinforcers and to determine interventions. Um, so we also pivoted to really intensively focusing on social and emotional support. And um, I think this is now sort of everybody's, we all know that this is what we have to do in the pandemic, um, but what does it really mean? Um, so for us at baseline, you know, we, we have overtly said we are not apologizing for prioritizing social and emotional needs. We're finding that that's really hard for some people, for some families, and for some teachers to, um, for all of us to sort of say, no, it's, we're not sorry. With this, our kids need us and we need to be there to support them emotionally and socially at this time. And that is what is most important. Um, so we continually remind ourselves that that's what we're doing. Um, our therapeutic groups have shifted. We used to really be skill-based and we have shifted. Um, well, initially we shifted to more process-oriented um, groups where we just checked in with, how are you doing? Like, what do you need? How is it going? Describe your experience. Students just really wanted to be together um, because they felt so isolated, so abruptly at home. Now that we've been in this for a while, we're starting to shift back more to skills-based groups, um, but always attending to, sometimes they just need to be together. Um, and social, social skills, you know, we really have focused, focused on how to be socially skilled in remote world. Um, and now as students are coming back into our building, you know, we're having to social skills again because students have been so isolated. And we've really re, just reinformed, refocused our trauma-informed lens, um, acknowledging that um, all of our students, that the pandemic has affected families, students, and frankly ourselves in many, many ways, and that we all need to acknowledge that. Um, another major uh, thing that we discovered is that we had to support parents in a much more intensive way than we ever have before. Um, because they're also in crisis, also sort of reeling, um, having many stressors that are, you know, beyond what's typical, and they lack the skills and the knowledge to support their students through this. Um, so they need support with technology. We increased our contact with parents um, very significantly. Our director provided concrete information, which they really were craving and needed, just what is going on, what is going to happen, and to the extent that we could answer that question. Um, we still have a weekly email from the director. Um, using Zoom and, and phone to have um, support guidance and support sessions with parents became a really critical practice. And giving parents really ready access to administrators and social workers. And so again, using text, we highly recommend that. We found it's a great way for parents to connect. And we also found that we really have to support teachers. Um, teachers are doing the brunt of this work and it is incredibly stressful and incredibly overwhelming and teachers are exhausted. Ooh, I'm getting emotional talking about this. Our teachers have really um, brought it and it's been really hard. And so we have um, from the beginning really recognized that we've needed to support them to validate 
what they're going through, to find ways to reduce their responsibilities, to give them breaks, to let them vent. Um, and you know, one of the ways that, for example, we did that was by having social workers step in and say, you know what, teachers, don't worry if your kid is, you know, disappearing. We've got that. We'll take care of it. We'll get them back into your class. Don't worry about keeping track of attendance, engagement, you know, that'll be on us. So that's one example. Um, and also just really helping teachers to reset their expectations and change expectations and um, providing concrete resources. So that, that's been very important. Um, this is an example of a tier two support plan for remote learning. So we were able to um, pivot here and provide students Zoom coaching um, around specific behaviors and offer different types of rewards than, than we're able. So maybe a, a, a cooking lesson one-on-one -on -one with a staff person who they prefer, or you know, just time spent on a walk, or um, you know, we had to really be creative, but this is just to show that it is doable. Um, we continue to meet regularly, um, both our daily staff meeting and our PBIS team meeting and engaged in all of the same practices that we do normally. Um, and we found that it, it was it, it was and is continues to be very important to um, to reinforce our community. So we had a strong community before we went out on remote and we needed to find ways to continue that community building even though we weren't physically together. And so every Friday afternoon, um, different teachers and staff members would offer small group activities for students that was, you know, that they could engage in. So we did, you know, one teacher might offer a family feud game. One teacher would do a Kahoot with like Cedarhurst based trivia. We had a book club, we had a cooking club, a music group. Um, and we found that students really appreciated that just um, fun time. And we did have school-wide community meetings by Zoom. We found that was very important to keep that practice up even though we weren't in the building. So now that we, um, and I'm gonna wrap this up soon so that we can answer your questions, but I just wanna talk a little bit about, we're in a hybrid model now. Um, so we have students both at home and in the building. Um, and when students are in the building, the students who are at home are zooming into the classroom. So we have synchronous learning going on. We have students physically present in front of us and we've got students at home. So again, thank goodness for PBIS because we've been able to figure out how to meet all of the needs of these different um, settings simultaneously um, by continuing everything that I've just talked about, but also helping students to adjust to really unusual expectations, like wearing a mask and staying six feet apart from one another is extremely strange. And you know now we're all used to it, but for students to do that in school requires a lot of support. Um, so we have, we've developed all new, um, you know, behavior matrix matrices and, and lessons, and we've even developed new behavioral expectations based in two different tracks, one for the students at home and one for the students in the building. Um, we folded our previous safety expectation into responsibility and respect, and then we developed COVID safety as one of our three expectations. So we can really um, model, coach, and reinforce these strange new expectations that we have of students. Um, we have found that we, you know, we have signs all over the place cueing expected behavior, um, and we do a lot of verbal cueing. It's been extremely important to remember that um, positive reinforcement to negative consequence ratio, and uh, uh, you know, not to just constantly remind students your mask is down, put your mask up, but but praise students who are doing, wearing their mask properly or who are maintaining physical distance or who remember to use the hand sanitizer um, to do lots of verbal praise, to do lots of tickets, lots of reinforcing. 
Um, and we've had to find digital methods of assigning points. So students don't carry cards anymore, because that's a vector. Um, and we don't have tickets anymore. We have, we, we have found a way to give digital tickets. Um, and this is an example of that. It looks very complicated, but we, we've been able to use um, Google to, and we've de-identified this data so students can see their own cards, but they can't see other students' cards. So these are the old behavioral cards. And we've also been able to differentiate for the students who are at home and the students who are in the building. Um, so their points are awarded differently. We have a weekly health and safety meeting for our staff. Um, and that's where we're really trying to use PBIS principles to reinforce staff's um, you know, healthy behavior in the building and mask wearing and distancing and, and reinforcing productive conversation around that because we, we found initially back in the spring that um, there could be a lot of anxiety around this and, and communication that wasn't very productive. Um, so in this health and safety meeting, we, um, we reinforce those practices. Um, we have found that we have to continue to support teachers in the hybrid model as they're trying to balance now yet another realm, which is you know, dealing with home and in person at the same time. Um, we use humor a lot. We, we try to laugh a lot at this ridiculous situation. And my mantra is we are where we are. We are where we are, you know, and we have to just move forward where we are. So that's what I have. I'm gonna turn this back over to Brandy. I'll stop sharing the screen. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Kitty. And Katie has been tracking questions in chat and in the Q&A poll. So we're going to get to those in just a second. But I just think that that was such a phenomenal example that illustrated how when you have systems and practices in place, it's a easy, quote unquote, easy to pivot. And certainly none of what you described is easy. And people in chat were saying, thanking you for being so vulnerable, especially in talking about the necessary supports for staff. So we always think about PBIS kind of supporting at all levels, not just kids, but staff and families as well, which that was such a nice illustration of. So what I'm gonna do in one minute is review big ideas and then turn it over to Katie to ask some of the questions. And maybe Katie, you can tell each of us who's gonna answer. Um, so that way we can mute and unmute. So just a refresher of resources, Bob started with a fantastic top 10 list grounded in, again, these principles of, prevention, investing in classroom, and really thinking about tier one being for all and all meaning all. So not just students with and without disabilities, but students of all genders and students of all racial and ethnic groups. We highlighted two new resources, new-ish resources around supporting students with disabilities. This is the top 10 list that Bob did so effectively. And these slides are available again in the file pod. We landed with this idea of having critical practices that we're going to emphasize. And I think this will be one of the questions is what does tier one look like in a more intensive setting like Kitty described. And for those of you still wanting resources, and I'm going to stop sharing slides after this, I just want to remind you that there is a spot on pbis.org that talks about kind of all of the resources that we need now, but also throughout this experience. So continue to check back for new resources as they are developed and posted, but also ask us. So if you are looking for something and can't find it, we love to hear from you and work on that. So I'm going to pause it here, pause sharing here. We'll put back up the evaluation slide at the end. But let me stop talking and turn it over to Katie for questions. Thanks. So one of the first questions, and I think I'll direct this to you, Brandy, um, was regarding, you know, in a school where uh, all students need intensive interventions, such as an alternative school, are there still tier one, two, and three? And what does that look like? Yeah, so Kitty, I think, could also speak to a really good example of this. I think a common misrule is that when you have students with intensive needs, you need to start with tier three. And my life before going to UConn and being a professor there was being a director of a school similar to Kitty's. I had students younger and older, but kind of that same idea. 
And like Cedarhurst, we had many students on quote unquote tier three plans. So function-based individualized plans. While that's awesome that they had individualized supports, for those of you who have tried doing that in real life, you can't actually implement that many individualized plans if you don't have a foundation within which to implement them effectively. So tier one is absolutely critical in more intensive settings, and I would argue it's even more critical. And what I've also learned over the years, and I think Kitty's presentation spoke to this, is those same critical features of tier one are required in every setting, right? They're more intensive. <laughs> but it's the same critical feature. So when we talked about connecting and screening and supporting, those are not different practices that we need in general ed versus in a self-contained setting. It's the exact same practices, just implemented more intentionally and more intensively. Katie, I don't know if you wanna move us on or if Kitty wants to speak to that a little bit as well. There are a lot of questions, so I think I'll move on. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, this one is more for Kitty, and there were a number of questions around data. So one participant shared that their school is struggling with collecting significant relevant data during remote learning. And do you have any data collection suggestions to help determine what additional supports a student may need during this time? Also, there's a follow up for that, but I'll let you answer that first. <laughs> okay, and I, I'm sorry I missed. Is this for full remote? Is that what we're talking about? Yes, during remote learning. Okay, so I, I mean, I I don't have a magical answer, but I for us, I I think everything really did root back to engagement and whether they were there or not, um, and defining what that looks like. So, what is engagement in remote? Um, and I, you know, I spoke a little bit about what, what we did, but to really break it down and um, keep track of it over the course of the whole day, rather than just talking about a day of attendance, but really how are they doing throughout the whole day? And it, it was, as somebody who actually had to keep track of that data, it's cumbersome. Um, it's a lot of work, but the reward is worth it, I think, um, in terms of keeping that level. Um, and if, for anyone that wants to reach out, I'm happy to share um, what we did and what we're continuing to do in that regard. Do we have our, are our emails posted somewhere? Yes, participants okay. can see the emails um, okay. by clicking on any of our names on okay. the front page. But don't click. But don't, don't do it right, now, right or now. now or you'll navigate away from the presentation. Um, so a couple follow-up questions related to data um, were, how are you promoting attendance and addressing attendance concerns right now? So for right now, uh, it's a little different that we have a whole program around attendance in normal times. Um, but we have to do a lot of work with parents. Um, we have to support, so not just haranguing parents, but really support parents. And sometimes you don't even start with why isn't your kid in school, but like what's going on with you um, and how can we help you? Um, and then, uh, and, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This is the biggest problem um, with the situation that we're in right now. It's very challenging. Um, I would suggest if, if folks haven't already is to try lots of different means of communication and not just the phone or email. Um, you know, again, I've said it in my presentation, but texting has been really helpful. Kids will respond to text and they will not respond to the phone or Zoom. Um, and then we are, you know, reinforcing be because engagement is the thing that we are setting as our expectation, we're not as worried about whether kids are swearing or whether kids are, you know, keeping their hands to themselves. Um, that's what we're rewarding. So, um, you know, reinforcing is really important. And offering, figuring out who, who kids connect with, you know, if you have new kids, it's harder, but if they're kids you had before you went on remote, um, having that person reach out. Um, whoever they've they connected with in the building before. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, another follow-up related to data um, was someone asked how your office referrals, what they have looked like since um, 
the return to school in the fall, um, have you seen any significant changes? So we um, actually are in the midst of a transition to hybrid. So we only have two small cohorts in the building. Um, we have our transition program in the building and our middle school in the building. But in terms of the middle school, we have not found, um, if anything, it's, I mean, it's a very small sample size, so it's hard for me to draw generalizations, but if anything, we've had fewer um, office discipline referrals um, and students have, have been more willing than I thought they would be to following all of the COVID requirements. I'm sure that that will, will change as time goes on. And we have the majority of our students are coming back actually tomorrow. Um, the high school students return starting tomorrow. So we'll see. Amazing, thanks. Um, there was also a question about student engagement. Um, so I might direct this to you first, Kitty, but then if anyone else has um, examples to, to add, feel free to jump in. Um, so you mentioned a student group and they were curious um, what that group does more specifically, just learning more about that group. And then curious about how you engage students in the development and implementation of PBIS. Um, so are we, I'm assuming we're talking about remote, remote and hybrid times in these questions. So when I referred to groups, um, those are therapeutic groups that were already in existence. So we had um, on any given day, every student has a therapeutic group that's run by social workers and we have social skills, DBT, yoga, lots of different types of things. And we found that in remote, we really had to pivot to just sitting with the kids. And when I say process oriented, that's a, that's a, a therapy, therapy language, um, but really just means sort of meeting the kids where they are, letting them raise the topics, um, helping them to support one another. Um, and, you know, if they aren't able to do that, to sort of address the elephant in the room, which is the fact that we're in a global pandemic um, and we have, you know, lots of um, civil unrest and we have this crazy election coming up and it's just everything. It's just really acknowledging all of that and helping kids process it, sort through it, um, figure out, you know, how they feel about it. And sometimes they feel terrible about it by just letting them have those feelings. And then there was the second part of the question, which I'm forgetting. Was just a more general question about um, how to engage students um, with the development and implementation of PBIS so that their voices are, are part of that process. Yeah, so as I said, it, we really used our student council. We have an existing student council who, um, you know, they're tasked with sort of like, um, planning fun activities to you know, develop spirit in the building. And so we have, um, once a month, we invite a representative from student council to come to our PBIS meeting. And we use, um, we use Google uh, surveys, that the students create them to ask questions of the whole student body um, about you know, asking for feedback about um, the point system or levels or, re, you know, rewards or activities that they might want to see um, to ask them for ideas. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, we only have two more minutes or a little bit less. And so I think maybe there's just time for one more question. And I'll uh, put this one to Brandy and Bob. Um, but there was a question about what are the few things a school leadership team can do or focus on to ensure that PBIS practices are being implemented with fidelity in every classroom. So in terms of data collection tools, processes, or systems that have resulted in positive outcomes. So we've used a, um, a classroom uh, management assessment that we stole from Brandy um, to, to really uh, get people to self-assess and basically, if you take those 10 practices and, and lay them out in terms of whether the teacher feels like they're in place, not in place, or somewhat in place, and begin to get them to, uh, and we do a kind of a brief training around these evidence-based practices, probably not the 
it's certainly a little bit more than 15 minutes that I dealt with that, but really explain what the evidence base and actually show them some data uh, around really how these practices help uh, on task behavior. Um, and then get teachers to fill out the self-management. It really helps the discussion in terms of kind of how, how we can support you in your classrooms putting PBS in, in practice. Great, thank you. Um, Brandy, do you wanna give concluding remarks? I just wanna thank everyone for their active participation. I know Katie and I were trying to stay pretty active in chat and we got to most things but I'm sure there are some that we missed as we were scrolling through. Um, and we're gonna also add at least one link after we conclude, which is to be positive. It's an app that I think also helps support what Bob was just describing, but allows teachers to track their own use of these practices, which I think is always a good idea, especially when we're remote. So thank you again for engaging with us and participating. Hopefully the rest of the forum is fantastic for you. And as you see on the screen, I'm sharing, we very much would like your feedback. We're hoping we're back together in person live next year, but there is a chance that virtual will continue to be our mode for at least some of the work we're doing. So we love feedback to help improve. So with that, we will close. Thank you to Bob, to Katie, and especially to Kitty for sharing such a fantastic example and for Therese behind the scenes for providing all of the tech support. And we will let you guys get on your way to the next sessions. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your forum. So this is something that I am not familiar with is how to end the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> so bear with me guys uh, while I'm looking that up, please. I'm afraid that if I press the end button, then um, that will kick us all out. Will that be okay with you guys if I try that? That's okay. You're muted, Brandy. Kidding. Yes, I think that's probably likely to happen because that happened with the keynote this morning is when it ended, we all we all were kicked out. So sorry <laughs> before you're ready. <laughs> all great right, job, everyone, everyone, you did great. Thanks for letting me join in. Thank you. Bye.